Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 19th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you can also follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain why, after first draining the statutory budget reserve and then the constitutional budget reserve, and now that they're on track to drain the PFD, some already are positioning to come after the permanent fund corpus. Second, we discuss what the Alaska oil and gas industry is not telling Alaskans about the next 10 years. And third, we explain why while they make claims that they are, those pushing for increased K-12 spending really don't care about middle and lower income Alaska families. And now, let's join Michael. All right, well, Brad, uh, let's get off to the weekly top three. It's full of acronyms, SBR, CBR, PFD, and then, of course, now the corpus. Um, it's like they're not even trying to hide anymore. Give us your thoughts here on number one of the weekly top three. Well, Michael, we saw in the 20 teens, in the late 20 teens, the beginning of a series of articles about K through 12, right? That K through 12 was in trouble. We had to spend more on K through 12, that it wasn't, it wasn't keeping up with inflation, that, you know, we had class sizes that were, that were busting out. We had all sorts of, of issues and, and the editorial pages were filled with, with one after another, after another, after another of, of, of op-eds on K through 12. We need to increase K through 12 spending. And so you can see, you can see when you, when, especially when you look back on it, you can see this, this tank coming or this cavalcade, this, this cavalcade of cars coming uh, at you for K through 12 spending. And we've seen what the consequence has been um, in the legislature. Well, now we're beginning to see the same series of articles uh, coming after uh, on the permanent fund and talking about the need to blend the two funds together, merge the two funds together, the earnings reserve fund and the corpus together, because otherwise we're gonna run out of money. And the latest in that, which is always the always the, the, the harbinger of, of more to come, the latest on that is an op-ed that uh, Larry Persley had in the Ketchikan Daily News. I'm sure it will go statewide and I'm sure we'll see it in the ADN, Juneau and elsewhere. But, uh, but it was an op-ed that first appears now in the Ketchikan Daily News. Uh, the headline in Ketchikan was, Permanent Fund Troubles Make for Sad Music. Um, and here's the pitch in the middle of the, in the, middle of the, uh, of, of the op-ed. The annual withdrawal from the earnings reserve is limited by law to protect the, law, to protect the fund from excessive drawdowns on politi and political whims. It all works well if the fund earns sufficiently higher investment returns than inflation, but inflation has been high and there, and there is no guarantee that investments always will be higher or high enough. That's the future that confronts Alaskans today. It is possible that the fund could run short of spendable money in the earnings reserve in the years ahead to cover its annual transfer to the general fund. That's the transfer that helps pay for everything Alaskans enjoy, such as public services, no state income tax or sales tax, and the beloved uh, permanent fund dividend. And then he goes on to say, to, pre to, to prepare for that future, to prevent that future, we need to merge the, the earnings reserve and the corpus together 
so that when the earnings reserve, so that when the permanent fund is not earning a sufficient amount to cover the draws on it, uh, we can just, we can, we'll, we'll still be okay because we can draw into the corpus. Um, and, and, and that's the pitch. He's not, he's not hiding it. The purpose of, and, 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 and really none of these articles are hiding because they can't, because that's the only purpose. The real purpose of merging the two is to get your hands on the corpus. So when the earnings reserve isn't earning enough, um, then you, then you can draw into the corpus and, and keep the, keep the good times going. It is, it is the same as the same pitch as we heard when the statutory in the early 20 teens, when we started in on the statutory budget reserve, oh, we need to draw it down because you know we just aren't we aren't getting enough for, from oil for a while, so we need to start start drawing down the statutory budget reserve. And then when we ran the statutory budget reserve dry, it was the pitch on the constitutional budget reserve. Oil's coming back. Don't worry about it. Oil revenues are coming back. We just need to draw into the constitutional budget reserve um, uh, for a while to you know tide us over until it, until that shows up never showed up, draining the constitutional budget reserve. Now we're $20 billion in the hole. Um, and, and then we started in on the PFD. In the middle 20 teens, we started in on the PFD. Oh, don't worry. Oil's coming back, but we need, to, we need to cut the PFD for a while to tide us over now that we've drained the statutory budget reserve and the constitutional budget reserve. We've heard this story all the way through. And shame on us if we're, if we're not getting the message. The message is, look, top 20% don't want to pay taxes. The oil oil companies don't want to pay taxes. The the non-resident industries, tourism, fishing, they don't want to pay taxes. Um, so we just need to we just need to you know go drain these other accounts for a while uh, to tide us over until something else shows up. Now the pitch is we just need to drain the we we'll just need to drain the corpus occasionally for a while until until returns come back. Well, there's no guarantee returns are ever coming back. I mean, part of the problem is the POMV is set at 5% and the permanent fund board, the permanent fund corporation isn't earning 5%. That's the problem. Now, in addition to that, they drained out $8 billion with two $4 billion draws in the early 2020s. And, and they're playing accounting games, rigging the accounting so that it looks like the earnings reserve is lower than lower than it really is. In addition, in, in addition to all that, but the real, the, the, at the end of the day, the real concern that's being expressed here is, oh my gosh, we can't get to 5%. And so, and so what we need to do is, is merge the two to be able to be able to get to the corpus. We can see this train coming. We can see this train coming. <laughs> and, and just like, just like K through 12, they're foreshadowing it. They're writing about it. Yeah. They're, they're letting us know this train is coming. And, and, and they're now personally is even being open about the purpose. The purpose is no state income or sales tax. So it's a top 20% don't have to pay. Non-resident industries don't have to pay. All companies don't have to pay. We're just going to take it out of the pockets of future Alaska families by starting to drain, starting to drain the corpus down. Yeah. And, 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 and shame on us, shame on us. If we don't say, okay, we, we see your game and we're going to stop it. Yeah, I mean, part of this is, I mean, look, this is a game of like three card Monty or shell game right in front of you. And you're watching the stuff switch back and forth. And you're like, I'm sure I understand what's going on here. I'm sure I know where the king is. I'm sure I know where the P is under the shell. I'm sure I know where it is. And then they go, whoop. Oh, it's not there. Okay. It's so confusing. I mean, they're just doing it out in the open. This piece from Persili, again, uh, I think it's hysterical because it points out the legislature cannot spend the funds principal. And then goes on, like you said, that first sentence, the annual withdrawal from the earnings reserve is limited by law to protect the fund from excessive drawdowns on political whim. That's to protect the earnings reserve, let alone the corpus of the fund. And then in his final plea, it's like, oh, but let's put a constitutional amendment out there so that we can draw it down for political whims, right? I mean, that's what it comes down to because, oh, here's a thought. Hear me out. Maybe we should live within our means. 
Maybe we should, you know, shrink the size of what we got going on to live within what we've got. Oh, and by the way, your accounting gimmicks of not counting the $8 billion you put in in the last four years uh, that was supposed to be for future inflation proofing, and now you don't count it against inflation proofing at all. So that's how you have a crisis. I mean, Brad, this is artificially manufactured from so many different ways, but the average Alaskan is not going to dig down into this and not understand this. And that's what they're counting on. Yeah, exactly right, Michael. I mean, exactly right. And 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 it's incumbent on us then, incumbent on us to explain this at every chance, at every chance we get. Um, again, you can see you can see this coming from miles away. Here's a here's another piece from it. The legislature and governor need to stop fighting over the amount of the dividend and place a constitutional amendment before voters to eliminate the line between spendable and non-spendable money in the fund and include a include a constitutional limit on how much can be spent in any one year to protect to protect the savings account for the future. We've already got a protection for the savings account. That's that's what the earnings reserve does. The earnings reserve is sort of like the last line of defense that under the constitution can't be breached. You can't get at the at the corpus of the fund. All you can do is get it at the earnings reserve. And so that's that's the line of defense. Now they want to you know throw away that line of defense and said, "Oh, we'll give we'll give you another one." a constitutional limit on how much can be spent. Well, there's no, I mean, it will be wrong. Whatever the number is will be wrong because the markets will produce a return or the, or the incompetence of the permanent fund board, which is what we've been dealing with the last several years, that will produce a return, whatever the return is. And the return won't be the amount that's set by the constitutional limit. It's likely to be less. Here's, here's the trick I'm waiting for. The trick I'm waiting for is is for them to start talking about what the constitu- constitutional limits is going to be, and like Ben's Ben Carpenter's proposed PFD uh, amendment, which had some rationale for why he did it there. But like that, they'll say, and the constitutional limit on on the draw will be set by statute, and 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 will constitutionalize whatever's going to be in statute. Okay, that's it. Right, that's right. The now door the, the door is now open. Yeah, because we can make it 8%, 9%, 12%. We can do whatever we want. We've got to have it now. We need it. Pay no attention to what's behind card number three. I mean, it's just, it's insane. It is absolutely insane. But this is where we're going. And now they're talking about it more and more. Uh, and again, they're not even really hiding it anymore. The, the, yeah. This is, you know, the, what is what is going on? Yeah. Um, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Quickly well, here, and, and we need to be we need to be looking at candidates on this issue. You and I have talked about this before, but one of the questions we need to be asking candidates as we as we head toward the general election is where do you stand on this proposal to to merge the two funds together? Because there's going to be a push to do it in in this legislature and in subsequent legislatures, and just like K through 12, they're going to keep banging on the door, and we need to know where the candidates are ahead of time. Harold says, my concern is the permanent fund is stalled during a time of record markets. Why is that? Uh, The fund value should be over $90 billion, but it didn't increase with the markets. Why? I think Brad just alluded to it. This mess we've got with the permanent fund, you know, board uh, that they've been dabbling, that the, the board is, you know, making suggestions or investments or, you know, Rubenstein's in there trying to gild her cage with things that's going on and everything else. I mean, They need some professionals in there who are doing it not for glory, but for the size of the fund. That's what the the, the health and size of the fund uh, instead of for, again, lining their own cages. Yeah, I've been doing some work. uh, It won't be in this week's column, but it'll be in a a future uh, uh, Friday column in the landmine. I've been doing some work comparing the performance of our fund to the Norwegian fund um, because that's sort of the gold standard out there about, about sovereign wealth funds. And we actually were, we've actually, the Alaska fund has outperformed the Norwegian fund, not by a huge amount, but has outperformed it. Generally speaking, uh, since 2010, uh, uh, up to about the last three years. And in the last three years, we've fallen behind uh, the Norwegian fund in terms of performance. We've also fallen behind, if you look at the permanent funds own benchmarks, uh, the three benchmarks that they that they publish their results compared to, uh, we've fallen behind in the last three years, um, and so it's there's 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 something that's there's something that's happened in the last three years, and if you look at it, what you're seeing is 
is the board, the, per, the makeup of the permanent fo- fund board being converted during Dunleavy's term, being converted from guys in gray, sh- gray suits and white shirts uh, with green eye shades who don't have public profiles and just sort of go about the business of focusing on investments, have knowledge about and focus on the business of going about and making investments uh, for return. You've seen the transition from that to people like Jason Bruni and and Ellie Rubenstein and and Craig Richards and others who have political connections, but have Adam Crum, who have political connections, but have no knowledge. I mean, even even they admit, um, other than for Ellie, uh, they admit they have no knowledge about the investment industry and about about what it takes. They're just there because you know, they have political connections. And in the case of Crum and Bruni, they're running for governor. So they want to, you know, get the, get their profile up. Um, and so it's, it's, it, we've, con- we've changed the composition of the board. And, and I wrote a, a column a few weeks ago that said, is the chaos on the permanent fund board costing Alaskans? And the conclusion was yes, because with these personalities and with all the infighting that they've started to do with each other and all of the you know, the stuff that Ellie was doing in terms of promoting her own investments and her own investment advisors. Um, We've seen a decline in the returns of the fund below the level, uh, uh, below their own benchmarks and then below compared to the Norwegian fund. So it's, it's, it's not always been the case that the permanent fund's been this way, uh, but it's certainly been the case, increasingly the case the last three years. Yeah, I mean, I think, and Donna is in agreement, uh, 100%, the board is pushing risky investments so it can play with big shots like Ellie's dad. I mean, that's the thing. It's become the sex appeal of the board instead of the work, you know, the daily grind of the work of building the fund up and doing what needs to be done in the right way. It's all about the PR, the visibility, the look what I can put on my resume kind of thing with all those political players in there. I don't I don't know if it's because they want to... Because they, I, it could be two things at once. It could be because they want to play with Ellie's dad, but it also, I think, it's more they just want their profile up. Uh, the the members of the board, especially Crum and Bruni, want their want their profile up uh, because they have aspirations that go beyond the board, and they want they want their public profile. So they're just not they're not they're not trained to look after the nuts and bolts, and they're certainly not looking after the nuts and bolts. And I think that's that explains. As much as wanting to play with the big shots, I think the fact we don't have people in there who are knowledgeable and experienced in the investment industry, I think that explains what's going on. Brad Keithley joins us every week to discuss oil, gas, and the economic forecast of Alaska. It's the Michael Dukes Show. The weekly top three continues with Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. And uh, I played that uh, that little liner there because it's true. Uh, the economic forecast, oil and gas. What is the oil and gas industry not telling us, Brad? Because there's been a lot of chatter. Uh, and I know Kerry Mor- uh, Mortiarty and, and others have been out there pushing really hard on some stuff. But what are they not telling us right now? <laughs> Yeah, as lawyers, you're trained as to look as much for the material, the, the omission of material fact, as you are to look for the material fact, the the admission of material fact. That the omission is sometimes more important than the admission uh, of material fact. And it, and it's interesting. I've been following. Tim Bradner has a has an op ed in the in the uh, uh, ADN uh, talking about the oil industry and has a paragraph in there that says Pika and Willow won't bring back. The state oil revenue boom of the 1980s. These aren't Prudhoe Bay type fields, but the new oil will help from Pika and uh, and Willow. And then there's an article in the in the Peninsula Peninsula Clarion about Kara Moriarty, who's the head of AOGA, the Alaska Oil and Gas Association, uh, a presentation she made down in Kenai about how important the industry and what the industry is doing. And again, uh, leaving the 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 implication with with Pika and uh, with uh, Willow that we're, you know, that we're on our way back to, to have a, an oil revenue resurgence. The omission of material fact uh, that they're making is that that's not what happens. <laughs> we, we've talked about it on the show before, but it's, it's important to keep in mind that when you look at the Department of Revenues, not stuff I've made up, not stuff anybody else has made up, but the state's official forecast, the Department of Revenues forecast, 
when you look at the Department of Revenue's forecast, they're certainly picking up in the production forecast, production side of the forecast, they're certainly picking up this boom that everybody's talking about in terms of production volumes. They have, uh, by the end of the forecast period, which is 2032, I think is where we're what we're using now, they have production above uh, 600 million a day. 600,000 uh, uh, barrels a day, and we're, we're below 500,000 right now. So they have a significant boom in, in production volumes. But when you look at the, at the Department of Revenue forecast, oil revenues, which is where it's important to Alaskans, where those production volumes turn into, into actual dollars, oil revenues stay flat across the, across the entire period. And in fact, the two uh, uh, components of oil revenues that are most closely tied to production levels, royalties and production tax, go down slightly. The only reason it's staying flat is because of the corporate income tax, um, uh, the petroleum corporate income tax on, uh, on, on petroleum companies. That's making up the difference in keeping it flat. But it's no more than flat. Uh, across that period of time. So when the oil industry talks a lot about, oh, you know, we're, we got these new production volumes coming on, all's going to be right with the world. We're not going to be back to Prudhoe days, but all's going to be right with the world. We got these big fields coming on. Isn't that great? And isn't, you know, all this spinoff that's, that's, that's occurring because of that in terms of construction jobs and in terms of, of economic activity, isn't all that great? Well, it's great for some people, it's great for those in the industry. It's great for the construction, the portion of the construction industry that's tied to oil. But for the state as a whole, it's not so great. For the state as a whole, because of the way some provisions of SB 21 operate, it's keeping revenues flat across that period. The, the revenues right. aren't growing in the same well, way. Kerry Moriarty goes on to talk about, oh, it's going to be 600,000 barrels a day by 2029, you know, or whatever. But that's great. But how many of those barrels are we getting paid on? That's the biggest question. And that's, you know, they're not talking about that. They're talking about gross production numbers, not the revenue. Yep, exactly right, Michael. And so you get, you get candidates out there that say, oh, don't worry about this. Oil's coming back um, and, and revenues will be fine. Well, that's not what the Department of Revenue uh, uh, forecast uh, tells us. And there's a couple of ways. I mean, we could adjust. I wrote a column on this. We could adjust SB 21. I mean, SB 21 wasn't perfect. It was good at the time. It, it, it did the job of getting more investment in the state, but it's not perfect. And 10 years later, you know, we're, we're seeing some of the imperfections in it. And, and you can make some adjustments in SB 21, which would fix that problem and tie revenues tie the state's revenues from oil to the, to the increase in production volume. And, and the state actually would benefit uh, from, uh, from the increased production volume, but that's, but, but that's not what's going on. And the oil industry, you know, I, you never admit facts that go against your interests, I suppose, but the oil industry is not being honest with Alaskans uh, about that fact. They're, they're, they're touting and, and Bradner sort of makes this tie. He's done that in another, you know, in an article in the frontiersman at one point, sort of makes this tie between production volumes and revenue. You know, we'll be okay because production volumes are going up. They're not being honest with Alaskans. They're, uh, they're omitting the material fact that, that th there isn't a link going forward between substantial increased production volumes and, and revenues. And, and we need to be honest. I mean, Alaskans need to know that because we need to know that, that these, this increase in production volume isn't turning into a bonanza for the state. Um, and as, and, and, and the consequence is as spending goes up, you know, we say, well, spending needs to go up by inflation. We can't, we can't, you know, short spending on inflation, we can't short K through 12, can't short the other things on inflation. As spending goes up by inflation, oil revenues are staying flat uh, uh, against that. And so the deficit is increasing. The difference between those two is increasing. And guess under current policy, guess who takes the hit from that? Well, it's middle and lower income Alaska families through through increased PFD cuts. That's the grease that gets that gets used to to, to keep fueling uh, increased spending while uh, while oil continues to 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 not not reflect increases. And so and, I, we just need to be honest with Alaskans about that. Right. I mean and I would agree with that. And interestingly enough, uh, it uh, it came it came back uh, in the end of this article in the Clarion talking about uh, Kara Moriarty and her presentation. Um, they're still pushing for the one thing, which, of course, uh, 
uh, they're still pursuing royalty relief. I thought that was the biggest. I thought that was the biggest admission in that whole article. That's what they're still pushing for. We we're not we're not taking in as much money as we were before. Oh, and by the way, they want more money. Now people will argue, well, royalty relief isn't really money because of like, well, it's an absence of of revenue. So it essentially has to be offset by something else. So it is more money. I mean, that's what it is. Yeah, exactly right. It's exactly right. It's the state subsidizing. It, instead of the state giving them money, it's the state subsidizing them on the cost side by relieving them of, of certain costs that they otherwise owe the state. Believe me, to producers, it's as good as money uh, in the in the bank because you don't have to pay certain costs. I mean, you get somebody else to pay your costs. Uh, and, th and in this case, it would be middle and lower income Alaska families are going to pay the cost. There's one other point I want to make on this, Michael. And it's a it's a it's a point that I that I don't get a lot of popularity points for making, but it's it's one that we need to understand. What's really going on as 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 we keep oil revenues flat, but oil revenues climb and all these construction contracts and all the other things that are going on in the industry climb, all the all the spending climbs. What's really going on is Alaskans are subsidizing the industry by not getting the same level of increase in revenues that uh, that the oil companies are getting as a result of, of increased production. Um, and, and Alaskans are really, you know, saying, okay, well, we'll, the, the, the effect of this is Alaskans are saying, we'll forego revenue um, uh, for, from, from the increased production you, the oil companies, can keep all that increased revenue that otherwise would come to us if we had a, a tax system that matched the increase in production tax. You, the oil industry, can keep all of that. And the oil industry says, okay, well, we'll buy off, you know, portions of the state by giving them construction contracts and, and, by, and by making them better. So portions of the state, those tied to the oil industry, get better as a result of the construction contracts and other things the oil companies are giving getting giving out the oil companies get better their stockholders get better and it's all coming at the expense of of alaskans mom and pop alaskans not getting the benefit of increased revenue tied to production i'm not talking about increasing the tax i'm talking about the tax staying at least level or rising in the same manner that that production uh, volumes are rising. And by Alaskans foregoing that uh, through the way that SB21 is operating now, by Alaskans foregoing that, they're subsidizing the industry and subsidizing those who benefit from the industry in the state. It's a wealth transfer, if you will, from the portion of the state that's not tied to the industry, realizes its benefits through royalty and production tax. It's a wealth transfer from that portion of the state over to the portion of the state that's tied to the oil industry and the oil industry stockholders. Well, and just for a second, we got about two and a half minutes here, Brad, left of this segment. But I mean, do a comparative because, again, you're from the oil and gas. For those of you who don't know, Brad is a former retired oil and gas attorney. So he's had pretty intimate knowledge of how these things work uh, on the backside. I mean, compare this to, you know, like places Qatar and and the the Near East and, and Australia. I mean, you know, they keep saying, well, Alaskans got to play fair. Well, I mean, I know that there's many places out there where the 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 landholders, the state, the governments, whatever, I mean, they're taking a significant chunk. I mean, much more than Alaska is in the long run of those revenues. And those oil companies are still working this, to this day to pump oil out of the ground out there. Um, are we are we being treated fair in that regard? Are we kind of a different critter? What's going on? Well, we've made ourselves a different critter. Um, in Texas, North Dakota, other places, uh, production taxes calculated on the gross royalty. So or on the gross uh, uh, revenues. And so those places, as gross revenues go up as a result of production going up, those places uh, realize uh, the benefits uh, of that. In other places, the Middle East um, uh, and, and, and elsewhere, um, the, the country, the nation owns a portion of the, of the equity. Uh, and so they get the benefit of that through, I mean, they're, they're part of the, they pay part of the development costs. They own a portion of the, of the production outright. And so they get the benefit of that through their ownership, uh, through their ownership share. Alaska sort of put itself in a, in a unique position. It's not at all like the lower 48 system. We have a net profit system uh, for our production tax. Uh, it's not at all like the, like the lower 48 system. 
it's styled more like an international system, but the problem is most of the international um, uh, locales also have, you know, like Norway, they also have a state-owned oil company that's getting a portion of the equity and earning a portion of the benefit uh, and then in that fashion. And we don't have that. So we're sort of out here in the middle uh, in, a, in a unique way. That would be okay if, if, if we had, if the tax structure and the royalty structure kept, you know, kept pace with the increased revenues coming from increased volumes. It would be okay uh, if, um, if we had a structure that did that. But what's happened is, is some of the provisions of SB 21 are now working against that and working in a way that reduce that share uh, that, uh, that the state's getting. So we're, we're, not, we're, we're not like the lower 48. We're not structured to get the benefits in the way the lower 48 does or take the, take the burdens of the way the lower 48 does. We look more like an international, but we're not really structured in the same way as an international because we don't have a, a state-owned oil company that's getting a portion of the benefits through in, in that fashion. So we're just sort of wandering out here in a way that's coming back to bite us. It's like we're the cream of the crap, right? We're not the bottom, the bottom of the top and the top of the bottom kind of thing. It's like we're in the middle trying to hybridize everything and it doesn't work as well. Uh, that's for sure. I mean, I think that's the biggest thing, uh, Brad, is that we continue, you know, we treat the oil taxes uh, in a way. We did this with ELF. We did this with ACES. We did this now with the uh, with SB21. You know, we treated it like it's a forever thing instead of modifying it as things, you know, go on or just finding a system that, you know, that works in other areas and adopting it that way. We have to make it our own and we're always trying to course correct. It's one way or the other. Either the state's taking way too much and squashing development and exploration or on the other side, we're giving away the farm in one way or the other. It, maybe SB21 came the closest in the fact that it's kind of trying to, you know, to thread the needle. But the bottom line is it needs adjustment. Uh, you know, we're not, the oil's leaving the state. It's a finite resource. And we're really not getting the Alaskans fair share. You know, there should be a little bit more in there on that. Yeah, it's 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 funny, Michael. I mean, I mean, the, the argument for not going and messing with the oil tax is because the industry needs stability. It needs to know what the rules are. These are long lived investments. It needs to know needs to know what the investment structure is at the time they make the that they can rely on, you know, the payout that they that they calculate based upon an oil tax structure over the term of the over the term of the investment over the term of the of the payout. And so they need that stability. And I don't disagree with that so much. Um, but the stability, it's the, it's, it, that sort of runs one way, right? I mean, when, when we had ACEs, which w took way too much and really did depress investment. Um, when we had ACEs, the industry was, was, was right up in the legislature's face saying, we need to change this. Yes. We know what the rules are. The rules are bad. We need to change this. Um, and, and I know we say we need stability, but we need better stability better stability than this. And the legislature said, okay, we understand that. So let's develop, let's develop something new. And now, and now that we figure out that, you know, over the term of its life and the way that things have evolved and the way thing, the way the industry is implementing it, now that we know that SB 21 isn't producing sort of the same share of, of revenues that, that, uh, that we anticipated at the front end of it. And we can see that over the next decade, as we look at the, as we look at the fork, revenue forecast, you know the state the state should be saying, you know, the chair of the of the House Resources Committee and others should be saying, well, we need to adjust SB twenty one to 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 get it more in line with the expectations that we had at the time it was passed back in back in twenty thirteen. We're not changing it in the sense that in the sense that we're that we're trying to re redo the 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 perceptions we had or the goals we had in 2013 were changing it to cert, to be certain on the state side that they continue to match those those goals uh but now the industry is saying oh no you know once it's locked in it needs to stay locked in forever because we counted on it forever just like just like hillcorp says you know we came up here because and you didn't have a a, a corporate income tax on s corps so we so we came up here and we relied on not having a petroleum corporate income tax on S corps. And, and, and yes, we know we're the only one in the state. And yes, we know that, that it puts a hole in the state's, in the state's revenues. And yes, we know that in the back rooms, 
we sort of chuckled and said, yeah, maybe we'll get away with this. Let's, let's keep arguing for it. Um, but you know, out, out front, they say, ah, we need to, we need to continue to keep this loophole because you know, that's, that's how we, that's how we make money. This, the state has a right to change things. And I'm not suggesting that the state go back to aces. They have a fiduciary responsibility to change things. Right. I'm suggesting we just go back to the perceptions or to the concept we had in 2013 of how we shared uh, the risk and the reward uh, of the oil industry going forward. It's a pretty good, it was a pretty good concept at the time, but things aren't working in the way that, that I think, you know, plays that out. You can see that clearly by the stagnation in oil revenues as oil production climbs. And we need to go back and, and address that in, in other jurisdictions. I mean, in Britain, they send they they set the petroleum tax in their budgets uh, once every two years or once every you know periodically they redo them in their in their uh, in their budgets. We don't do that. Uh, we've got more stability than that. But it's not like you know it's not like in the world people don't change their oil regimes. I'm not suggesting we change the oil regi- regime. I'm suggesting we we refine tune it to get back to the to the objectives we had in 2013 when SB 21 was enacted. Right. I mean, because it makes sense if you go down 10 years down the road and you realize this wor- isn't working quite as intended and it's benefiting one party more than the other, you should be able to revisit it and say either, you know, if the state's getting more than it should, then that should be revisited. If the oil, you know, it should be viable. But instead, we've got a lobby that's out there saying, please don't touch it because we'll leave the state, take our bat and ball and go home. And you're like, well, that's great, except it's our baseball diamond. You can take your bat and ball all you want, but we own the diamond. So somebody else will come in and do it if that's what we need to do. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, our guest, the weekly top three. On to number three, who is the fastest hour in radio for sure. Brad, <clears throat> the K-12 lobby. I mean, we were talking about this earlier. They're not even trying to hide it. And the K-12 lobby, I think, feels emboldened in the same way. They're not even trying to hide what's going on. They're just like, give us more. Um, that's that's all we hear. More. In fact, my favorite quote out of everything that we heard before here, defunding public education has been devastating for our schools. Defunding public education? When did we defund public? I mean, if a veto of an increase is a defunding, we've got some serious critical analytical thought problems going on. If you're saying we gave you a $200 million increase, but we vetoed a hundred million dollars of it, it's still an increase. We're not defunding schools, but that's what they're saying. Yeah. There's, there's, I, I want to sort of talk a little bit about a subset of the whole K through 12 issue. Um, I'm, there's, there's a lot of stuff to talk about through about K through 12 to spending too much, declining student population, increasing spending, all sorts of, all sorts of anomalies like that. But I want to talk about a subset. Um, and, and that subset is who pays for, for this, uh, for this increase in spending that the K through 12, the K through 12 lobby was once there was a couple of opinion pieces in the past week. I mean, sort of, a, they're, they're increasing the pace as we go through the election cycle and, and head toward the session. But there were a couple of opinion pieces in, in the ADN, at least, uh, the past week. One was, uh, the title was, Put Students Before Politics and Funding Alaska Schools. Another was, Alaska Schools uh, Need Our Help. And both of those were, you know, in different words, all discussions about how we need more, pay, pay teachers more, we need more money in schools, we need to more teachers to, to cut down class sizes. We need all sorts of, there's all sorts of reasons that, uh, that we need, that we need more money in a few of the earlier columns. They at least pay the industry, the, the, the lobbying for this at least paid attention to the issue of who, who do they propose pay for this increased spending? Uh, there was one editorial I recall in the frontiersman, uh, where it went through the same sort of argument about why we need increased spending. And at the end, it says, and we need to pay attention to who pays for this. Uh, uh, we should ensure that all Alaskans pay. You know, we should look at taxes and, and, and other things. At least they were honest about it. It was at the end. It wasn't a big part of the conversation, but, it, but at least it was in there. Now, they're not even talking about that. Now it's just give us more. And... <laughs> And, and here's, here's what they're essentially saying. 
They're saying, we don't care where it comes from. We know it's going to come from PFD cuts because that's where it's come from. We don't, we're, we're not trying to stop that. Just give us more. And, and they're, they're essentially throwing middle and lower income Alaska families off the, off the boat. They're saying, look, we need more. We need more spending. We need more for us. We know that the top 20% doesn't want to pay. So we're not going to even ask them. We know that oil companies don't want to pay. We're not even going to talk about changing rates. Spending's gone up since 2013, but we haven't changed the tax rates on the oil industry since 2013. But we're not going to talk about that. We're not going to talk about non like like they do in 49 in the 49 other states plus the District of Columbia. We're not going to talk about non-residents making a contribution to state to state revenues. We're not going to talk about that. We're just going to say we need more. And we know that more is going to come from, unless you unless we decide otherwise, we know that more is going to come from middle and lower income Alaska families. So it's it, it's elitist in the worst possible. This argument is elitist in the worst possible way. It is elitist in terms of we deserve increased spending and we deserve it on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. We're not going to, we're not, we're not even going to breathe a word about the top 20% oil industry and non-residents uh, contributing to the cost of it. And it's just, I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it is elitist. Give us more, give us more out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families um, don't talk, don't touch the top 20%. Don't even talk about taxes. Don't talk to touch the top 20%. Don't, uh, touch the oil companies and don't touch, uh, touch non-residents. And I, th that's a horrible message. I mean, it's, it's a message about, about, we feel entitled, uh, as, as the education industry, we feel entitled to more and we're, we're not even going to worry about it being broad based, the more being broad based. We we're entitled to more and we're entitled to it coming out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families. Sometimes they'll talk about, look, education is important because it allows kids from middle and lower income families to pull themselves up by the bootstraps, to learn, to get ahead, to do. But, but, but when it comes to who pays for this increased spending, they don't care about it. They don't care about middle and lower income Alaska families. All they care about is getting their more, uh, and, and getting it, uh, you know, in a way that that uh, without without advocating for a broader based approach, in a way that's going to come from middle and lower income Alaska families. So I I just find it a very troubling message. I find it a dishonest message in the sense that in the sense that we need to be treated specially in terms of spending, and and it's in in even though we will argue that everybody benefits from that. We're not going to charge everybody for that increased spending. It just needs to deep. It just needs to come more and more and more out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families. And I, and I, and I think that's a very troubling message. Well, and it's disingenuous in a lot of ways. I mean, first and foremost, why should they be treated different <clears throat> than any other employment sector in the state of Alaska? That's the first question. And then this argument about the BSA and how it's all about the children and class size and everything else. And we've talked about how the BSA doesn't really account for that. I mean, the BSA is about overhead and other things. Uh, they've slipped in the argument. One of the opinion pieces slipped in the argument, talked about the PERS and TERS program, uh, you know, highlighting the beauty of defined benefits. And I would only have stayed if defined benefits had stayed the way they were and everything else. And again, why, you know, the, the big question is, and it's disingenuous, it's dishonest to basically say we need to be protected over all other uh, employment sectors in the state. But OK, the legislature is listening to that because, again, to them, the state spend is the economy. So they've got to protect the economy. Yeah. And 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 they've got to protect the economy at the expense of one segment of a, of a very of a very targeted segment of the state, middle and lower income Alaska families. It's it, it, I would give them I would give them some additional credibility if they at least stood up and said, we need more. And it needs to come from everybody because everybody benefits from this. And so everybody needs to contribute and we need to have it in a, in, in the, the revenues need to come in a broad based way. We need to, we need to look at non-resident industries. We need to look at the oil companies who haven't had a change in their tax rates since 2013, even though spending's gone up since that period of time, we need to look at the top 20%. We need to look at it in a way that, that, that everybody contributes, but it's, but they're not saying that. I mean, it's every, we need more 
And by not talking about where it comes from, not talking about who pays, they're clearly, you know, targeting middle and lower income Alaska families because that's where it came from. That's where it's come from for the past several years. Yeah. And you can see that this, of course, is going to be one of the big topics uh, coming back. I mean, they're not letting it go uh, until they get that target. I mean, they got a slight increase, but until they hit that target of 1413, which is, you know, almost three times, two and a half times where it was at, uh, where it's at now, uh, almost three times what it was at uh, before, you know, that's what they're going to keep pushing on. But I mean, again, we're talking about when you talk about doubling the BSA from where it's at today, there is no permanent fund left at that point. I mean, it's a significant amount of money at that point that uh, that nobody's asking, where does it come from? We got all these great ideas and these great programs, and nobody is asking who pays on any of them, whether it's royalty relief or defined benefits or, uh, you know, the or the, uh, the the teachers pay or anything else. Nobody's asking those questions. Like I was talking about yesterday, it's this willful ignorance of, it'll never happen to us. We're too big to fail. We'll always have money no matter what. We can't be out of money. We still have checks you know, kind of thing. And that's where we're at today. F finish up, Brad. We got 90. Well, it, you know, it, it spreads, it spreads all over the place. I mean, it, it's not only K through 12, it's not only the other things that you talked about childcare. I mean, it's the Republicans too. The Republicans have big, been big proponents of childcare, uh, you know, subsidies for childcare or for tax credits for childcare. But, but again, it's who pays, who's paying for that. And, and the way we've set this up, the way Republicans have set this up, is it comes from the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families. They they don't want they don't want to go broad based because they know the top 20%, the old companies and and the non-resident industries fishing and tourism will push back against it if they try, if they try to broad base it. So they just keep taking it out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families. And that's just I mean they're undermining the state. When you look at who's leaving the state, when you look at the out, out migration it's occurring in the middle and lower income brackets. When you look at the working age population, it's occurring in the middle and lower income brackets. When you look at, at how Alaska lines up against uh, inflation, uh, it's, it's working against them. I mean, that's that's the problem, Brad, is that just nobody is paying attention. I was talking about it again yesterday, this, this idea that somehow we'll just make it. I mean, going back to the train analogy, we know that the track is running out, that there's no more track. The track is the money, just for folks who couldn't figure that out. The track is the money and the bridge is out. There's no more track across the bridge. There's no trestles. And they're like, hold my beer. Watch what happens here. We're going to we're going to jump that gap. We're just going to keep shoveling coal into it. And away we go. It's going to be fine. And it's not going to be fine. You know, that's the problem. There will be some kind of catastrophic problem ahead because we cannot control the spending. And we don't, aren't talking about where it's coming from. And that's, that's the biggest problem. And they see that, I mean, personally, let's go back to personally. Let's go back to segment one. They see that bridge coming, right? I mean, they say the, they see the bridge is out. So now what they're doing is they're saying, all right, let's get in. Let's get into the permanent fund corpus. It's big. People won't notice if we take, you know, a few billion here, a few billion there. Um Problem is they can't confine themselves to a few, few billion here, a few billion there, but but you know they see that bridge is out, and so they're they're rapidly trying to build a new bridge to get into the into the permanent fund corpus under this under this 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 argument that oh my god we're we're you know we're going to have a crisis if we don't uh, if we don't merge the two two accounts together because you know we don't we're not earning enough, so rather than reduce our spending to what we earn, we need to increase. We need to just you know tap into the tap into the corpus, um, it, and and they and and again, I mean, they're not taking it from themselves. They're not taking it from the top twenty percent. They're not taking it from the oil companies. They're not taking it from the non-resident industries. They're taking it from future Alaskans. It's it's anybody. I wrote a column once. The title of, of it was anybody but me. You know anybody anybody but but. You, let's let's keep spending, but let's pay for it with anybody but me. And it was about legislators, all of whom are into the top twenty percent now because of the pay raises they gave themselves, Mike Cronk included. Um, uh, it's it's anybody but me. Do this spending with anybody but me. Um, take it from you know middle and lower income Alaska families. Don't take it from the top twenty percent. Don't take it from the oil companies. 
Don't take it from non-resident industries. And if you do that, you just keep on spending, keep on spending and spending and spending because there's no pushback. There's no pushback from, you know, the donor class. There's no pushback from the oil companies. There's no pushback from the tourism and the fishing industries because they don't have to pay for it. They don't care. It's uh it's a problem. Brian said, I thought Brian said something a while ago that was good. He goes, look, no one wants a tax, but we're adults and we understand math. And that's kind of the basic idea here. We're already being taxed. Yep. And so shouldn't, if it is a tax, shouldn't it at least be equitable and across the board and make sure that everyone pays the same rate? I mean, again, nobody likes a tax. Taxation is theft, right? I mean, I'm I'm all on that board with that. But if you're going to force me to pay a tax, shouldn't everyone have to pay a proportional tax as, you know, to their income or whatever else? Shouldn't that make sense? Um, or at least to their consumption, if that's the if that's the worst case scenario, at least to the consumption. But something, somebody's got to pay something. It can't. It just doesn't come out of thin air. Yep. And but but it's it's coming out of thin air. From the perspective of legislators, all of whom are in the top 20%, from the perspective of the oil companies, and from the perspective of the non-resident industries, it's all coming out of thin air because they're not having to pay it. So child care, yeah, that's good. Hey, our employees would love that. Our employees, most of which are in the top 20%, would love, says Conoco, uh, would love that. They'd love, yeah, let's do child care. Let's do a tax credit for child care. Um, and then I can essentially have the state pay for state, state pay for the child care that I'm I'm providing to my top 20%. I don't have to pay for it as an oil company. They don't have to pay for it because they're in the top 20% and the non-resident industries don't have to pay for it. That's great. Let's just, let's just have more and more and more of that. The only way, in my opinion, we've talked about this before, the only way to stop this spending increase is to have, is to make, is to do the, is to do the income side, the revenue side, make it broad based. Then you have, then you have the top 20%, the donor class and the oil companies and the non-resident industries pushing back on the on the increased spending. As long as they don't have to pay, we're just going to keep going down this road. And Ron actually makes a valid point. I was talking about this again yesterday. By the time the state crashes, all of those who caused it will be gone. Because we've seen that before, right? They're here for a period of time, you know, 15, 20 years, and then they retire to some other state because they got theirs and while well, the getting was good, and then we're left holding the bag on the other end. And that's the that's the scary part is when we're left holding the bag on the other end. Yep. Yep. And that's and that's what, you know, going back to the first segment, going back to personally again, uh, that's essentially what the argument is. Uh uh you know, we, we've run out of money. We run out of the SBR. We run out of the CBR. We we're about to run out of PFDs. So let's just keep this train going by building a new bridge out there to let us get, let us get to the corpus. And, you know, maybe that lasts 20 years. Um, yeah. It lasts, lasts long enough for the oil companies to, to pay out the fields that they're investing in now, and then they're gone. Yeah. So they don't care. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, the weekly top three. Brad, thanks so much. Uh, are you going out to vote today or did you already vote? Michael, I'm going out to vote today. All right. All right. Get it done. Don't, don't, don't forget. We're just getting it out there. So appreciate it, Brad. Thanks for coming on board and joining us today. As always, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3. <laughs>